Hello, everybody, and welcome back with the Fab Fatties. I'm Alyssa. <laughs> oh, they already are off the rails. I was waiting for her to go. I thought you were going to go. I just gave the intro of a lifetime. You did. You, you really did. So you nailed energy. that. You absolutely nailed that. Okay, that's Allie and that's Rebecca. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Rebecca. My bad. Hi, I'm Allie. <laughs> I'm in trouble already. <laughs> um, we have a different topic today, something that we haven't spoken about yet. And I'm right. kind of excited. Um, we're going to be talking about... Fat phobia in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So I have a statistic to get us started today, which is more than 40% of U.S. adults report experiencing weight-related stigma at some point in their lives. This can, in, in the workplace, this can take form as teasing, taunting, um, and microaggressions. And what I find really interesting is that research has found that as obesity rates in the U.S. have risen, so has weight discrimination. Yeah, that tracks. I feel like that tracks for sure. <laughs> yeah, because I think I think the more people see it as a problem, the more vehemently they're trying to like push against it. And and a lot of people do think the the way to solve things is shame. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to my childhood. You know, like <laughs> if you get in trouble enough for this thing, yeah, it will be corrected. Yeah. If you yeah. hate yourself. Yeah. I think it's interesting. So it doesn't say like 40% of overweight adults. 40% of adults mm -hmm. yes. face weight stigma. And and, you know, when I think about some of my experiences at work, the people who talk most about the weight are not people who are fat. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Um, That's my question. I want to hear, before we go into, like, all the the facts and figures, Barry, um, I don't know what movies that's from, but I've quoted that now like three times in the last week. And well, I'll never get it. So. I need to look it up because I'm actually very good with quotes and I'm very sad that I don't know what it's from. But I want to get before we get into all the facts and figures, I want to hear like your stories. So I want to hear like your workplace, your workplace. I will definitely get into mine. Um, but that's where I want to start there. Yeah. Yeah. Who yeah. wants to take it away with their workplace? Are you vibing with us? Adam and Eve wants to vibe with you, too. <laughs> All you have to do is go to adamandeve.com now. Adam and Eve is offering 50% off just about any item to our babes with code TFFPOD. Talk about getting it up. But that's not all. When you get one item, they will also send you three bonus sexy items and six free movies. Again, just for being our fab supporters, you can enter code TFFPOD at checkout and you'll get 50% off almost any item plus 10 free movies gifts it doesn't matter how much you spend or what you buy all will be packaged and sent discreetly bow free i think i feel tears of joy coming on coming on anyway don't forget use our code tff pod that's tff pod at adamandeve.com and let adam and eve put a smile on your face today I will start with a general okay. thing because yeah. i i have been open that i work at a ymca yeah um and there's a gym aspect to that, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. While the YMCA is more than a gym, that's our biggest thing, like letting everyone know we're more than a gym. We're like a community center with programs and all these amazing things. There's a gym, yeah. right? So I think when I talk about this today, it's really hard for me to separate the, the fat phobia from the diet culture because one, I think there's so intertwined and ingrained sure. with each other and also in my workplace they are yeah you know i li literally was walking in the hall the other day and we we have a nutritionist company that that is on site at the y and uh they have their marketing and you can go and talk to them and get counseling and the number one thing on their banner that they help with is um controlling your weight oh. and i'm like oh you know it's just like, that's the number one thing? Yeah, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I bet it's the number one thing that drives people to want to work with them. Yeah. yeah. Especially when you're at a gym, you yeah. know? I was gonna say, it's, it's advertising the thing that most people want to buy. 100%. Well, because it's advertising the thing that's most heavily advertised, yeah. which is weight loss. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. and think about, like, the amount of, like, social... Um, grace, social mobility you yeah. get from... Yeah, being thin, right? And we'll, we'll get more into that later, but yeah. The yeah. social currency yes, that, of being that's thin. It, yeah. I think what will shock people is that I have worked for the YMCA for the past five and a half years. And I've been at one branch. And at that one branch, 
I've only been up to the fitness floor one time. Is it like a triggering thing for you? I just feel unwelcome. Yeah. I've taken the, the classes before, like a Zumba class, a kickboxing class. Those feel a little bit different to me yeah. than the fitness floor does with like all of the equipment and like going up there. And now, sure. you know, I just think we, we hear a lot. I'm sure that could be a whole nother episode about how people feel in, um, you know, in the gym, gym and spaces, in spaces, yeah. you yeah. know, where you're physically moving your body. Um, but. I was I was covering an MOD shift over the holidays at the branch and I had to give a tour. And that's the only reason I went up there is I was giving a tour. So I was like, I guess we're going to see this for the first time together. (laughs) Um, So so I think it just speaks to a little bit of the environment. Right. It's not like a personal experience. It's. It's more of like, I just don't feel comfortable. Sure. And and I know the people, yeah, right? I, I say, have do relationships. Know, do you know the people that work up on 100%. the floor? 100%. Yeah. Right? Maybe not every single person, but like enough. Yeah. yeah. I know all of the, the key staff from the key staff meetings. Yeah. So, yeah, I just feel like there's a message of like, not for me. And I don't think it's necessarily just the why, right? I think that's just a fitness in general I feel sure. like unwelcome what sure. about you so I work um at a university and I've worked there for a, a over a decade now oh, great hairs um <laughs> and my workplace is interesting because in a, in a good way actually this time it's interesting because um my colleagues like in a, in a university setting you obviously there it's a huge setting there's so many employees there's so many people and what we happen is we have departments and so our colleagues are really our department colleagues it's who's who's that's who we're working with most closely um, but a lot of my work is solo you know I'm teaching I'm out doing my own thing and I work with my colleagues on departmental stuff and faculty meetings but I'm not seeing them a lot um, but what's nice about my department is it is mostly women and men who hold feminist ideals so I love that for you yeah so what I find <laughs> is like it's not okay <laughs> to put across misogynistic viewpoints it's not okay to body shame um and I think where I feel probably the most eek is around food um mostly just because um I do have s- several colleagues that are uh vegans and not just for dietary purpose, but for political purposes, you know. Gotcha. And I think sometimes I hear in their messaging some things around food that make me feel uncomfortable and make me feel watched with what I'm eating um, and what my choices are. And that can make me feel uncomfortable. And, of course, some people have individually said things that make me realize that they view, like, I can only eat so much. I, I need to temper this. I'm being so bad eating this thing. Right. right? Like, I get yep. a little bit of that. But I don't get um, the very explicit pushback. Um, in fact, some of my colleagues, I've felt very comfortable sharing that I do plus size fashion. I do a podcast. Now, the group I feel comfortable with that with is is a much smaller group. It's like three to four people that sure. I feel really can I can talk to about those things and they understand it as identity. And I, And I will say like, where I work, we do look a lot at like writing language and identity and they understand that identity is complex and they understand that we have embodied identity. So like in that way, because I'm in an academic space where like people are very aware of those things, I feel I get more acceptance um, and more reassurance to explore my fatness as identity, um, mm, which is, that. I feel like it's a unique experience. Yeah, I love that. I do think that is unique. Yeah, I for think sure. that's really cool too. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. How about you? <gasps> Did not have that experience. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, now I, I guess I work for myself. Yeah. Um, but so I don't shame myself. Um, but coming from the real estate industry was I yeah. I was gonna say traumatic. <laughs> Traumatic um, would be the nicest word I could probably use as far as um, body image goes, as far as the um, maybe the 
the microaggressions, I think, mostly. Um, but also there is very much, um, I think now, too, with the emergence of, like, I mean, we've always had HGTV, right? So, like, yeah. you've always had the the house hunters and the the beachfront bargain hunter, whatever, like, and you see normal everyday realtors, right? But then you get the selling sunsets and the, the whatever. The glamour you know, the, industry version. The, yes, very much on Netflix, right? And then it's like, there, there does become this, this idea of what a realtor looks like, right? Um, and it is a very, it is, it is a very, uh, image conscious industry it's a very like you know when we talk about you know our trainings where you know this is how you show up this is what you look like this is how you dress this is you know this is what you drive this is how your car looks this is what your bags look like you know like um and not necessarily like you know oh you know written in a handbook somewhere like oh you must have a Louis Vuitton and a Lexus but like just like this is these are the steps to get to, like to the poster of what success looks like in that industry. Yeah. Um, with that said, obviously, a lot of it is um, with a lot of it being image based. I faced a lot of. Um, a lot of language, I was around a lot of language that really fucked with me like every day and. Um, I was also on a team of all women for a long time, uh, for several years at the end of my real estate career, um, which they're all, they were all wonderful women. Um, and you know, they all, um, you know, they were all, they were all so beautiful. I thought they were all so beautiful and they were all straight sized women and most of them very thin women. And uh, nine times out of 10, at least one would make a comment every single day of, oh, I'm so fat today. I am so disgusting today. I look so gross today. And I'm like, I am right fucking here. <laughs> I'm right here because they're talking about the way that they look. They're talking about their bodies and saying like, I look so fat today. Now, I also understand. I understand that we all grew up in the same society, right? We all grew up in the same society that told us thin is good, fat is bad. Like you don't want to look like you don't want to look like your teammate, right? And if you look fat, you look X, Y, Z. Exactly. Long yeah. list. If you, because that's the thing, right? It's it's not like the more that we talk about this, the more that we dive into it, we realize it's like people aren't necessarily afraid of being fat. They're really afraid of being treated the way fat people are treated, right? Mm -hmm. And and it is. It's You realize when like I think back, I think about the conversations that people had around me that I just, I would never do now. Right. I used to. I used to because I had that that programming. I had that 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 diet culture language. Right. And um, I mean, the only, you know, the the group bonding in in real estate was um, my I think the first like kind of thing I got into um, to really kind of bond with my fellow realtors that the very beginning of my real estate career was a Weight watch a Weight Watchers um, thing that we all did. I was going to say, since I was a teen. The way I sometimes related to friends was to do group dieting. Exactly. So I think it's it is very ingrained in women's culture. Yeah. 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 And, and then in an industry where you might be around a lot of women, that yeah. can play a part, especially if again, if if the women have bought into that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And 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 you know, every every vacation that somebody was taking, oh, I need to lose three pounds before I go to Mexico. And it's like somebody who's like a size two. And it's like, and I'm just and every single day it was everybody was eating salads. Like I, so I, there was no way I was going to eat anything other than a salad. Right. Like, like we ate Panera like every single day. And, um, that was just my green team leaders, like favorite thing. Um, so we had Panera every single day. I had a salad like every single day. <laughs> and like, it was just, I was afraid to not perform. Right. Mm -hmm. Not perform as the good fat girl who was eating her veggies and like, you know, oh, yeah, I also feel disgusting today. I also feel gross today. Like because I, I mean, at that point, like I also hated myself, too. Right. But 
But it wasn't just them, right? It wasn't just them. It was also the environment, the like the they they teach you in like these trainings, right? Like of, you know, of the calendar blocking, like start your day with, you know, your 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 gratitude and your affirmations and then go for a run and then eat your egg whites and like they live in your trainings. <laughs> they're telling you So against the way I live, so I'm just like L O L. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can, I see you wanting to say something. I do, yeah. and we can totally cut this. But yeah. I only if you're comfortable. I'm genuinely trying to figure out how it is, how it affected you when you were working there. And I feel like a lot of your defense mechanisms are coming up. The laughing, the okay. smiling, the, <laughs> and it's and it's okay. Like what we're talking about yeah. is really hard. You lived it. Yeah. So like if you need to do that, I I really understand. Yeah. But like, you know, people are commenting about their bodies all the time around you yeah. and in an industry where you're trying to be successful and you're trying to stand out and you're trying to connect in. So I'm really just trying to, I don't know, connect with yeah. what it was actually like, you know? Well, thank you for calling me out. Um, <laughs> no, uh, you're right. I, I do. I very much, I use humor as a defense mechanism very often. Um, it was fucking traumatic. Um, I felt both completely invisible mm. and so exposed at the same time mm. in very different ways. Oh, that landed. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of fat people can relate to that yeah. feeling. Yeah. Because it was very much like I, because again, these are beautiful women. These, they're absolutely beautiful women. And so again, it, like it breaks my heart thinking back especially one of them. Like she was just, she was, she is, she, she's a beautiful woman. She's a beautiful mother. She's a beautiful wife. She's a beautiful person. Like she is an incredible person all around. And one of her first thoughts every single day, and I say every single day, it just, there was so many times. And so I know I'm exaggerating, but like, this is what I think about when I think of her. And I don't want to, because she is an incredible person. But all I can think about is how many times I remember her saying, I'm so fat today. Mm. I'm so disgusting. And this girl is like over six feet, legs for days. Like she is stunning. She's absolutely stunning. And I'm not trying to like objectify her, but like I never saw it. I never saw what she saw, right? But like every day I'm like, if she thinks she's disgusting and she's saying that about herself, mm -hmm. what does she think about me? Yeah. Right? And that was in a time where like I still very much cared about what everybody else thought about me. So it was like, if that's what they're saying about themselves, what are they saying about me? You know? Yeah. I mentioned that, you know, my colleagues, I don't see them very often. Yeah. And the people I do see more often are my students. You know, like, I don't get to say my work is only my colleagues. It's, yeah. it's not. It's yeah. my students. And a lot of students come in um, with very definite messaging of, like, body image is important, but also fat is bad. And we have to make sure we are healthy, da 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 da, -da. Like, mm -hmm. we remain active, da da da, -da. And again, it's, it's very much like you can't be active and fat, you know, like they, they don't see it as like right. you're, you're only fat if you do X, Y and Z, you know. Um, and I remember when I first started teaching, um, my class theme was specifically how we use language to form our identity, like what words we choose, how we engage, how we speak, how we vocalize ourselves. Um, and. I remember talking with my students about being fat and, and there's, there's, a, there was a series of years where I did not feel comfortable anymore talking about being fat. And I am back to talking to my students about being fat. I love that. And, and I think people need to know, like whenever I, cause we introduce like language bias, we introduce how people use terminology to create meaning towards people. And I talk about my experience with the word fat and and kind of how whenever I was young, it did feel outed to be called fat. Yes. I was very obviously fat. I physically was fat. I was living that experience. Mm -hmm. But until someone said it, I didn't think it mattered. Um, and then as an adult, really like taking back that word. And my students, I, I get two responses. And I would say 95% of my students listen to me, think I'm a bit badass for saying it. And they're a little bit shocked to have a teacher be so candid yeah and it makes them feel more brave to be vulnerable yeah. uh, and I've I've noticed that I do have a good bit of students that disclose to me that they're trans 
that they struggle with an eating disorder, that um, they're a lesbian, any any kind of identity thing that they might get yeah, discriminated for. Yeah. I find my students do feel open telling me about those things and not only telling me about those things, but telling me how it affects their lives. Yeah. Hell you know? yeah. yeah. And then I had the 5% that giggle, makes them a little uncomfortable. Maybe they think a little less of me for it. And and in that 5%, I have 1% to 2% that are actively aggressive towards me as a fat woman. Um, I had that a, like? It's been a couple years since I've had someone where I know they're making fun of me for my weight. Um, but there was one student I vividly remember. He was an adult student. He had been in the armed forces and came back into mm-hmm. teaching with me. He had a lot of problems with authority. He did not like me giving him assignments. I don't know. We're in the school. I was in school. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, it, there's nothing I could do about some of that stuff, sure. right? Um, but the classrooms I were in were tight. It was hard for me to get around to my students. Yeah. I, the walking. We'll, we'll probably get to that later. But, like, one time I was walking and my foot caught a cord of someone's computer and their laptop, shoop, right off the oh, desk. Oh, no. Okay. Um, I felt bad no matter what. Yeah. But he said something about it being how big I am, that that's why that <sighs> happened. And he said it loud enough that I could hear him say it to the person next to him. And y'all know how my hearing is. But you know what? He said it loud enough anyways for other people to hear it. And he would actively, like, just shake his head at me or, like, do things like that. Did you kick him out? No. Like, when he made that comment? No. Why? Um, Because I was young. And I also feared. His response? His response and taking up authority. Yeah. Um, It got to the point where I asked a co-worker to come sit in my classroom. um, And then he stopped coming, so that helped. But, um... There's been a couple times where students have said things um, that make me really uncomfortable. And part of that is some of them will do decide to research obesity. And I'm always like, is this pointed? Like, is this pointed? Okay. A pointed cho- choice? Like, did you decide to write this stuff about how obese people are hindering the medical industry or doing X, Y, Z <gasps> as a choice because I'm your teacher? Did you think about the fact that I'm reading your texts? And I don't know if it's purely that this idea just is an idea that's so accepted to them Mm -hmm. that they don't think about the fact that I actually have to sit there and read what they say. Yeah. Um, Or like I have a student this semester who did, and for him it was an internal thing. You know, he said, okay, as a high schooler, I was 300 pounds. I did X, Y, Z. He he really is working on his own self-image and body image. but. I, I get affected by the stuff they write. Some of them write really awful things about fat people. And I have to maintain the teacher yep. yeah. distance to it. Yeah. Hey, friends. Do you want to contribute your stories, questions, or topic ideas to the pod? You can now submit written, audio, or video content to us for consideration in a future episode. You can find the link in our show notes as well as in the bio of our Instagram page. Hope to hear from you soon. I mean, I don't work with adults, Mm -hmm. but I work with kids. And I'm often struggling to navigate the body stuff, Mm -hmm. right? The little preschoolers, there are some preschoolers who will come up to me and be like, you're fat. They they just, they're just saying, (laughs) they don't mean, like, I don't think they even understand. And and I'm like, yeah, I am. All all bodies come in different shapes and sizes. Yeah. Yeah. But before I did the work, Mm-hmm. I would go cry in a little corner, yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, I navigate kids calling each other fat, like being mean to each other. Okay, yeah. and I navigate the, um, I navigate the self body talk in theater. Right, kids sure. being like, "I'm fat, I'm gross, like I'm this," and I'm like, "Okay, so where do you start with that with kids? Yeah. Do we start with the why is fat a bad word?" Why do you view your body in a negative way? You know, it's easy when another kid saying to another kid, hey, we don't comment on anyone's bodies, period. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Done. Not acceptable If you, in any situation. I don't care if you're angry or anything. We don't comment on other people's bodies. Done. Um, it's way harder when the kid's coming to you being like, you know, I hate my body. So trying to <sighs> navigate those conversations. And on the flip of that, right, is... 
I run the theater and dance program yeah. and I'm a fat woman. Mm-hmm. Right? There yeah. is something very... I don't want to say it's projected from anyone other than myself, but like when I'm teaching a dance class, I'm up, I'm sweating, I'm out of breath, yeah. I'm doing the things. I'm like giving my all. Even if the kids aren't sweating, I'm a sweater. Yeah. Like I'm going to, I think it looks a certain way. And what's that way that you think it looks? I think it looks in a negative way. I think parents view it as a negative. I don't think the kids view it as a negative as much because I think genuinely they love me. So like we have fun when I'm in the classroom and like they're not thinking twice. I mean, some kids are like, Miss Alyssa, you're really sweaty. And I go, yeah, that just shows how much harder I'm working than you. Yeah. Like, I'll, I'll, like I'll like smack talk them back, you yeah. know? Yeah. Um, and they think that's funny. Like I'm yeah. like, yeah, I'm a sweater. Uh, but I think sometimes... It look it feels and looks different in the dance world than it does in the sure. theater world. It's so interesting because like my first thought when you're talking about like the kids saying to the other kids, my sister told me the other day that my five year old nephew, some kid at his school called him fat, and he, and he's telling his mom about it, and she's like having to process that with him, and yeah, and kind of like it's already starting. He's in kindergarten. Yeah, it is already starting. And so my first thought when you shared that was like, thank God, thank God these kids have you. Oh, in that program, a hundred percent. Yeah, thank God they see a fat dance teacher. I was thinking, I'm not the even religious. Same thing. Thank God. Okay, <laughs> I was but like the same seriously, thing. but then, but then, I totally feel what you say about just feeling the gaze of others. Yeah, and how they might interpret that view so differently. Like if you have the value of body diversity, if you grew up not seeing yourself in places, you're like, you're a radical bitch (laughs) dancing in that class. And it's transgressive and it's beautiful. But if you have this other view and you have to deal with it because you have parents or whoever. And this idea again of like the marketable why stuff. Yep. And that really tarnishes the beauty of it. I can I can totally feel that. Before oh sorry Ellie. No, it's okay. I just I was thinking the same thing there of like I can't imagine, like, would I be sitting here today if I had a fat dance teacher when I was a kid, you know, or something like that. Like, it, I just told you the other day that I read a book. Uh, again, I, I was reading another romance book. I don't know what's wrong with me lately. Um, but, uh, like, but it, and the, the lead character, the, the, the main girl, she was fat. And, like, the, the storyline was that she was a fat, um, x-rated content creator and she was and i absolutely love that i don't know why i said x-rated like i'm five like she was a sex worker and like but she was fat and she was like she was like heavily desired and like i literally i texted and i texted you and i was like Alyssa, i think i'm getting emotional over a romance book right now but like it's a representation yeah that representation so like i can't imagine where i would be today if i had some of that representation when i was younger so absolutely like you said yeah there there might be that 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 mom or that dad that's standing outside of the class going why does my kid have a fat dance teacher but i guarantee you there's a kid in that class that's going to remember that all bodies can do all things because i had a fat dance teacher when i was a kid yeah and she danced harder than i did oh i hear you i know it's it's it, i swear those little like negative like i remember that one student i can picture him yeah but the the students who've been kind to me, yeah. you know, they start waving in together, and and it, it's it's because it's so hurtful when you do encounter yeah. someone that you know dismisses you or devalues you purely because of your size, and it it hurts, so yeah. it stays in there. And um, unfortunately, sometimes those negatives can stand out more than all. Like you know, you got like what twenty kids laughing their butts off dancing with you, but that one parent that you feel like is staring at you that. It takes your attention away. It's it sad. It's annoying that yeah. that's what happens. Yeah. You know, today I really wanted to make a point when I was sharing like personal stories and and fat phobia in the workplace. I work with amazing people. I really do. And I hope if, if there's one thing that people take away from today's episode, I really want to them to know and for me to share that advocating makes all of the difference. Like some people just don't have to think about it because it's not their life. You know, I came back from treatment and came back to work and we had redone the office when I was gone and I needed a new office chair and they could have gotten me one of the generic ones, but I spent a little extra time 
did research on office chairs that were built for larger bodies for comfort, found it in like the similar-ish price range and requested it. It was a yes with no hesitation. Yeah. Yeah. I have to sit in that chair for eight hours a day sometimes, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, can I be comfortable at work? Yeah. yeah. You know? Um, when we were sitting in for summer camps, um, the first summer camp session is funnily enough, like in September, right after summer camps finish, we start talking about it for the next year. Um, and we were like spitballing ideas. And the woman who was in charge of youth fitness was like, hey, I want to do a nutrition camp where kids can come and learn how to read food labels and like do count calories and all this stuff. And the woman who was in charge said, yeah, we're going to have to talk about that because statistics show that that's not healthy for our kids and that that can lead to eating disorders and disordered eating. So we would really need to sit down and talk in detail. Like, are we normalizing all foods? Like, Maybe we're not looking at the nutrition label, but we're talking about what makes a well-rounded meal with fats and starches and fruits and vegetables and, you know, all of our food groups included. Um, But she was like, it can't just be fitness, counting calories, reading labels like that's not going to fly. And that moment, I wasn't even involved. I was just sitting in the room. I was beaming. I was like, I feel seen well, yeah. in this space. Yeah, because it's so important. Like, it it really is to have to have that moment where like you don't have to speak up for yourself because somebody else spoke up for you. Yes, and like, because like again, like I just I had the complete opposite. Like, of moments where like the team is ordering like new T shirts or new jackets, and like there was a big deal. Like once you were official on the team, you got a jacket. You got a jacket with the team logo and everything. And it was like, okay, we're ordering new jackets. We're ordering new T-shirts. This company goes up. And this was, I mean, I was um, I was at, like, my, my heaviest size um, when I was on the team um, or, or close to it. This was, like, during COVID, whatever. Um, but so I was in a, I was in a larger size. And the girl that was in charge of ordering merch um, – she was like, oh, yeah, so we, we found a place that they, they go up to an extra large. Oh. And, I just, and I'm and i still tongue-tied. I'm still tongue-tied because I'm like, I, on the one hand, I don't want to tell this girl that there's no way in fucking hell that T-shirt's going to fit me. But on the other hand, like, I I... What do I say? What, I can't wear the shirt. I mean, respectfully, she didn't have eyes because if you look at your boobs, an XL ain't fit in one of them. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like, I, I can't imagine what that experience would have been like if somebody who was ordering shirts was like, no, we can't go with this company because Allie can't fit in their T-shirts. Let's yeah. go with a different company, right? Where I didn't have to advocate for myself in front of the entire room. Oh, Like when they're talking about, oh, we're going to go with this company because they have this V-neck and these three quarter sleeves and they go up to this size and have to raise my hand and be like, "Um, hi. Yeah. I'm the only one in the room that this doesn't apply to. And yeah, it would be super nice for somebody else to think about that. Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking um, it it basically comes down to like what people say and how they make the conversations. Right. Yeah. And unfortunately, it does often rely on you to change the conversation and some people are going to be more comfortable with that and some people aren't, especially depending on power positions and so many other things. How like how much your respect is up for debate, what's valued there. Like, I do think that conversations change when I'm in the room. Yeah. And because they know they can't say certain things, you know. And I do think when we talk about like diversity in my workplace, they know I'm going to bring up body diversity. You know, my colleagues will talk about disability, but they often don't get to bodily. You know, they, they tend to think um, neurodivergence. You know, they think about learning. And I'm like, yeah, and some of your students can't fit in the desks in your room. Yeah. And do you think that affects their learning? Yeah. It does, you know. And so I'm that voice. Um, and I hope that me speaking up enough will then make other people have that little voice in their head. Yep. But. But darn it, yeah, the job's on me. You know, yeah. we're back to that Lizzo quote. It's, if someone's going to do it, it's going to have to be me. Yeah. You know? and, yeah. And it it it's a burden to bear. Yes, It'd it be is. lovely to have an ally in it. 
hundred percent. I would love to go into some of the statistics that you I brought for us today. I just pulled it up. I wanted, I was going to say <laughs> 72% of U.S. employees who have experienced unfair treatment at work due to their weight say it has made them feel like quitting their jobs. And 11% of HR professionals say that an applicant's weight has played a role in decisions um, their organization has made during the application process. Just a 10% increase in body mass can result in a 6% reduction in salary for women. I hate that. And you found that research um, in NPR's research? That was from, so actually I found, I was doing my deep dive and boy, we're going to get into my deep dive because I (laughs) spiraled. Okay. I my notes spiral. <laughs> Allie was reading through them and was like, "Are you good?" And I was like, "No." Are you okay? <laughs> um, so there's this website called shrm.org. Yeah, it's for human resources. Thank you. I was going to yeah. say it is like the U.S. It's human the big resources association. Yeah. Yes. Thank mm-hmm. you. It is okay. a legitimate site. It's everything. So yeah, they pulled a statistic from NPR. Okay. Um, that was that last one that I just shared, but the first one is from them. Okay. Um, and then also they shared this t- statistic that um, their research has found that obese employees are more likely to be perceived as 27% lazy, 23% unmotivated, 17% unprofessional, Yep. While the average weight employees are more likely to be perceived as high performing, 35 percent, hardworking, 32 percent and motivated, 31 percent. And this is why we need implicit bias training at all workspaces. Yes. Because <laughs> notice I said perceived. Yes. Said yes. Perceived. Perceived. It is perceived that the average weight workers are hardworking. They're doing their work. They're doing all the things. It is perceived that the overweight or quote unquote obese workers are not doing their jobs. Correct. Right. But if they weren't doing their jobs, would they be there? There's that just that's just one question. That's just one question. I have a lot of questions. I'm fired up. Let's go. Let's talk statistics, everybody. Let's talk that. Where is that found? So this is where I'm gonna spiral. Let's go. And I'm gonna bring you along with me. We love that. Boop, boop. So as I'm buckled up, so as I'm sitting at my computer doing research for this episode and pulling up statistics, I find something that the CDC released in 2009. I'm scared. I am too. I actually want to pull up the exact words for you. They, the CDC released a quote, obesity cost calculator. Oh. I'm sorry, what? Oh, I know where this is going. Wait. Insurance premiums for companies. Money, to money, money. To tally the financial losses linked to their overweight employees. So, I'm not even there yet. I'm not even there yet. I'm going to spiral more. So it's called Lean Works. Lean Works? Lean Works, and it stands for Learning, oh no, excuse me, it stands for Leading Employees to Activity and Nutrition. The website provides a very uh, various resources to employers, including an obesity cost calculator where em- employers can input employee demographic data and estimate the total costs associated with obesity and determine annual obesity-related medical costs for their companies. Two, information and resources to help employers plan, build, um, and assess interventions to combat obesity. Interventions. And, and that's the word they use. That's the word. Interventions. That's the word. And number three, to info, um, information on how employers can estimate return on investment and measure of the cost of an intervention compared to the expected financial return of the intervention, whatever. Return on investment. Uh, yep, exactly. Return on investment. So, I, like, this is all, this is capitalism. I'm going to let you rage. Oh, I absolutely. will, I do want to say, it has, it has been dismembered. It's no longer active. 
Okay. The they, harm has been done. The, the harm has been done. They dismantled it in 2014. So it lasted a bit. Mm-hmm. But I, I still raged because I'm like, one, this is not a new issue. No. And two, how are you supposed to combat that? Like, no wonder there's a there's fat phobia in the workplace. Like, the government's literally giving you tools. You're literally putting, like, numerical values on human beings. Right. You're literally saying like, oh, this person is going to cost you more. This person is going to cost you less. This is capitalism 101. This is why fat phobia and capitalism go hand in hand. That's why there's so much intersectionality with fat phobia, because it's just so like like they brainwashed us to think like, oh, it's going to cost you more to have fat people. What? And that, like, this is, this all of this has been so eye-opening to me, too, because, like, ever since we started doing this, we've gotten so many comments about, like, oh, you're the reason that my health insurance goes up every year. Like, I didn't re- even realize people thought that about us. I had no idea that there were so many people. We get so many comments about health insurance costs. Number one, it, it takes an act of God to, t- to get me to the doctor. I have to know a lot of fat people so don't go sick. seek medical care. Yeah, uh, why? I know. That's why I find it almost ironic. Yeah. Because I'm like, uh, for years, I would kick and drag my feet before I went to the doctor's office. Yeah. Like, I was actively avoiding it. And why is that? Because we get treated like shit at doctor's offices, too. I mean, but, um, this is very much like... We are the drain on society. If you if you were not aware, we are the drain on society, bringing them down. I just because of their damn medical insurance, you know, payments for us. I really think that's what a lot of people think is that their taxes go to us. Their what and, and, in the hell? And not just for being fat, but for being women too. You know, I'm sorry. Damned you want to know where their taxes pro- are going right now? You want to get real fucking political? You want to know where their taxes are going to bomb kids in Gaza? I feel like there's a lot of people who want to say who gets to have what medical care and what that medical care gets to cost and who gets benefits and who don't. And it is, it's eugenics. I mean, I'm sorry. It is them trying to have a very specific population and anyone who doesn't fit in it can get the F out. A hundred percent. So while I might not um, say it with my chest, like Ali says, (laughs) 100% agreement. Sorry, not sorry. It's because my chest is so big. I have to. (laughs) It just bursts with energy. But... Yeah, I mean, this is where I think of, like, the traditional, like, in-office. Let's see which office group can walk the most miles. Let's yep. see. You know, and it, it the is. The weight loss challenges. Yeah, it's very competitive. It's very health via competition, health via performance. And I think we we have to question why do we only see health via competition performance? You know, it, why is that the initiatives? And, and what money are like what money is a company putting into the health benefits of their employees because besides the mental health benefits yeah because i will say where i work they told us about a, a mental health app we can download that has basically like self-guided responses you just pick the response and it guides you down right or i mean it's, it's a way to say you have a product we have something. They give you a meditation app. We it's have. Products. We actually now have. I do not know their official title, but we do have someone who oversees like the mental health and well being of like all of the staff, and like goes around and does like workshops about like how you take care of yourself at home, and like journaling can be a tool, and malfascialitis release, and like all of like actually. And that's awesome. It is. It is kind of awesome because to be like, where I worked, most of the health benefits are like most of the mental health benefits are for students, which <laughs> so the bad. students absolutely <laughs> need the mental health benefits yes. that we offer. Um, but like, the thing that I struggle with, and this this is a little bit like off, but the mental health benefits aren't clear to me the same way me being able to go to my general doctor is. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, so like I haven't navigated that because I don't think it operates in the same way and I don't think I have very clear benefits whereas I do to go to my doctor for things um but even so some people made comments about this on our Oprah Ozempic you know episode of of you know they want to say obesity is this disease it needs to be treated da 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 but then insurance companies still won't even approve that right so Correct. then unless you are a rich fat person mm-hmm You can't access the medication that they're telling you you need to take. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's a little bit like damned no matter what because there's there's really no support either way. Yeah, Yeah. I I spoke to my mom a lot about that 
from the Oprah episode, like in depth being Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, if it's a disease, the only thing that's marking it is the weight. Right. So mm-hmm. if the weight's gone, then you don't have the disease. If the weight is there, then you have it. Yeah. And and even, right? even like, in some of the comments, people are like, yeah, it is a disease because I experience hunger in this way. Right. But that's not the definition. According to these doctors, it's correct. not about your, your feelings of hunger. So it's just all very murky. Yeah. Murky, 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 because it doesn't fit neatly into a box of something that, you know, yeah, medically needs to be treated in a certain way. And it is so varied in experiences. Um, and. Yeah, we, we could go off on that again, I know, but let's get back to the statistics that you had. So, with all of the statistics, <laughs> with all of the statistics that I shared and with the obesity calculator, mm. what would you want to see at work? Yeah. Because, <laughs> be, I, I mean, for anyone who's like, oh, you know, like obesity in the workplace, like, I mean, fat phobia in the workplace, like, I didn't know this. I, I, the workplace is just like everything else, right? Yeah. P- everyone's, ex- same thing when you go to the doctor, they're ex- doctors are exposed to diet culture, right? Yeah. Like, there is a dialogue happening. Yeah, I think in general, this fits into broader discussions Correct. of accessibility, inclusivity, and yeah. all of that, right? Like. It fits into other things that also need to happen for other people. Yes. Um, it's not just changes that only need to happen and are going to benefit fat people. Yeah. You know, where I work, um, they were doing this really cool thing, which is unfortunate. I'm going to add the unfortunate part. Where I work, we say, we do, but we say mostly that we value diversity, equity, and inclusion. Okay. And there's a lot of support in certain ways. And one of the coolest things I saw happen over the past two years was a task force being created. And it was asked, what are the topics that affect diversity, equity, inclusion? And I was able to speak to that director because she came to us and asked us. Oh, I love and it. And I said, you need, and this probably fits into accessibility, but you need someone talking about bodies. You need someone talking about how we fit into spaces, what furniture is being selected for these spaces. Yes. Because I do work in a university where a lot of furniture is the old connected chair to the table you know i have they have one desk that's always meant for like an accessibility right but there's not always only one student that needs it in the classroom Mm -hmm. but again what furniture would benefit all students when we make these changes right and and i recognize like the university can't update all the furniture at once but as they go can they make better choices you know so this was a really cool thing except you've probably noticed if you've watched the news that there's a national pushback against DEI initiatives. It's happening nationally, all right? And we've seen a lot of attention on Florida, but it is happening in our state. In Baltimore, too. It's happening in North Carolina. There is pushback to remove any state-funded DEI initiatives, positions, et cetera. So while they can't make us not talk about it, because freedom of speech. They're fucking trying. They also can remove any financial support for people to do do devoted work on it. And that's what I'm seeing where I work is that that is going to be disbanded. That important work can't happen in official capacities. It would have to happen in ad hoc volunteered capacities. And so, again, and I and I recognize this is this is why there's activists. It tends to happen on unpaid labor from people who are. Zealous advocates, you know. And there got to be people that step up for it, but it is absolutely at their own detriment half the time, you know. And and luckily, I feel like where I work, there are people who will, and and I certainly will where I can and how I can. But I understand it's 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 unpaid labor on my part, and it's also unpaid emotional labor, and it's because we don't want to talk about the fact that people have different experiences. Yeah. And that they're not included in spaces and that things aren't equitable for everybody. It's like the dirty secret that if we say, if we talk about it, then we have to put blame on somebody. I? There's, we don't care about blame. We care about change. I just don't understand where the issue is on making spaces where everyone feels welcome. It's what she just said. I just don't understand it. Yeah. It's that, it's that people don't care about the change they care about who to blame 
and talking for about what? it talking about it makes them have to say we're responsible yeah because that's the thing is that it, it at this point it doesn't matter who's responsible just make the changes make the changes right like okay you learn something bad you learned a bad behavior you learned a bad and i don't even want to call it bad like it just whatever it is right like unlearn teach yourself something different right we've taught ourselves something different we right yeah. we were we taught we were we were taught our whole lives that thin is good, fat is bad, that we should be ashamed of ourselves. We should be ashamed of our bodies. Like all of these things, right? We've unlearned that. We're, we're still unlearning all of that. We're still teaching ourselves new things. We're, our ideas have changed. Why can't everybody do that? Why can't everybody look at it and say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where these beliefs came from. I have the power to change things. And I think that's exactly what it is. It's people don't want to sit there and say, I might have some responsibility in this, so it's my responsibility to change this for myself. Yeah. I have the power to impact things, and people kind of look at it at like... Well, now it's become a political mouthpiece, right? And so, yeah. So it almost, I think some people see it as like a weakness to accept those programs because they see it as a calling card for like the left-leaning parties. And so to have it then makes it seem like there's they're right or that there's power there right and and it's unfortunate that that's that inclusive spaces and talking about bias and all that is a political stance yeah when it should be a people stance yes it should it, just be a it should be a humanity thing right. yeah it should absolutely be okay someone said that this doesn't work for them let's change it someone said that this isn't okay Let's take a look at it, right? I do think change happens on an individual level, but I also think change happens on a big level, but it doesn't happen on a big level without the individual, right? I think people have to start saying, like, look, nobody's coming to save us. Nobody's coming. The, the government's not coming to save us. Like, nobody's coming to save us, right? So, like, we individually have to say there are things we want changed, right? The fat community, the the... Well, Every I'm, community I'm that we're a part of. Happy to hear that Sherm is saying it. That's nice. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Those but, associations need to say it. Yeah. yeah, and and that's from that article, like all those statistics were from yeah. 2024. It is recent. So that's they are aware of that what is, is reassuring. happening. Yeah. Yeah. I went off on a tangent. It's no, it's okay. I I uh, my takeaway from this entire conversation and and who I am as a person. I'm just going to keep doing the work, yeah. you know, and I'm going to keep doing the work and hopefully educating the people around me so that they can join in the work and for everything, you know, I no longer when, when I, when I, when it's performance weekend and I go in and say hello to all of the families coming to see the show, I don't say welcome ladies and gentlemen. I say, Hey everyone. Yeah. Welcome to opening night. Yeah. Right. Just that little change in verbiage yes, exactly. can make people feel more welcome, you know? Yeah. I just don't understand truly, like, where people get all worked up around inclusive language and inclusive actions. I want people in the room. I want to hear different stories. I want to meet different people. And if that means, you know, even when we talk about kids, if you need to sit on a yoga ball and bounce because you can't sit still at your desk, then I want you to sit that yoga ball and bounce because I want you in the room with us. You, you know, value that diversity. Exactly. I, I do. And I think I really, really struggle when people are so against it because I just don't understand how it affects them. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's. That's what I was trying to say is that, like, I don't understand how – I don't understand the waiting for the massive movements. I don't understand that everybody isn't taking that exact same kind of ideology thinking if I just make – I can make small changes myself. I can make small changes by saying, hey, everyone, instead of, hey, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I can make small changes by saying – for me personally, right? I used to be a meaner person. I can make small changes by saying, ew, I don't like that girl's hair or or I hope that girl's hair makes her really happy. You know, like I hate who I used to be, but I changed that about myself, right? Yeah. Like you can make those small changes and that does lead 
to massive change when individuals can take those little changes. And you're right. Like, I don't understand why people are like, well, I'm not going to call it's it's Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. And and I'm not going to do I'm not going to do he, she, they, them, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And it's like, what is what is so hard? What is so hard? If someone told you their name was Jim, you would call them Jim. Yeah. So they told you to call them they call them they. Yeah. What is so fucking I think, hard about I it? I think it's um, I think some people are curious, open to change, love to learn, love to know people. And some people it's a hill in the, it's they're digging their hills in the sand. They want sameness. They want their worldview to be very confirmed to them in all kinds of ways. It can be same for them. I know. but, but OK. Uh, you know I'm, I'm saying? not saying no one's asking you I'm to not sit saying, on the yoga ball and bounce. I'm not saying you can right. sit in the chair. No, I know. Uh, this is where I just like want to beat my head in because yeah. I just don't get it. Like, I don't but, have to call you they or you don't have to be fat. You don't have to be whatever. Right, you don't need right. to sit in the larger chair. You but like I'll be to. more comfortable. So but like, can how I? How am I hurting you yeah. by being in the more comfortable chair? Yeah. How am I hurting you by bouncing on the yoga? Yeah. Ball? So so. I say all of this to wrap it up with the what I will continue to do is what I'm doing, which is advocate for my own needs, because through advocating, uh, people around me are learning that yes. larger bodies need different things. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to continue to make spaces where people feel welcome because I know that I can also learn from their lived experiences on how to feel safe in a space and create a space where you can come and be brave in. Yep. Um, I have one final question. For our viewers or listeners who might currently be experiencing um, weight-related stigma in their workplace, or honestly any kind of stigma in their workplace, um, but we'll start where, we're, where we know best, okay? What would, you, what would your advice be right now? How to, how to handle it, how to, how to approach it if they do want to? I'm going to let Rebecca speak last because I already feel she's going to have the most eloquent answer for this. She'll have the mic drop. Um, <laughs> so I think... No pressure. What it, no, I don't mean it to, with pressure. I just feel like you're so good at answering these things. But I think for me, I know that each work environment is different. All work relationships are different. So I would start with who do you have a relationship at work with? Mm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a close relationship with your supervisor? Do you have a coworker that you're really close with? Anyone. And just sit with them and talk through it in a factual way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes emotions at work, I don't think are heard. So I would, I would say, hey, <laughs> you know, I, every single time we have a meeting in this room, I have to stand because there's not a chair that I fit in. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask to get a chair put in this room. You know, how do you think, what are you, what is your feelings on how I should go about that? I always think it's good to have a sounding board of someone who knows the company and knows, you know, the ins and outs. Um, but what I have learned, and I still don't know too much about it, is that there are, like, HR is supposed to have, like, an accessibility something or other to help mm -hmm. people who need specific uh, accommodations, so that is where I would probably go next is to HR being like, hey, I don't I'm not hopefully, you know, maybe I'm not willing. I don't want to make a big issue out of it. I just want to feel welcome in this space. Yeah. You know, I don't know what people are dealing with. I don't know if they're blatantly dealing with, you know, fat phobic verbiage and language. I think you just need to also assess the company you're working for. If they're not willing to make the changes to make you feel accepted, then it probably doesn't align with who you are and what you want. And then I think it's time to start looking for a place that will. Yeah. And start talking about it in your interview process, you know, yeah. being like, hey, like, are you guys open to making accommodations? And what is what is your um, view on the DEI work? And just like yeah. asking. Yeah. One of... Like the very first thought I came to mind was like the actual talking with your colleagues part because I feel like um, we're used to spaces that don't accommodate us, unfortunately, right? Like, so it, it can be the people that feel the most toxic. And I'm not confrontational. I run, I'm fight or flight, flight every time, okay? <laughs> I'm not confrontational, but 
I do think there comes a point where you have to decide, do I want to be liked or do I want to respect myself? Yeah. And that sometimes means telling someone when the conversation has become uncomfortable to you. That means walking away whenever, like, if you're sitting at lunch and your coworkers start talking and maybe it means getting up and no longer eating lunch with them and sitting at your day. And sometimes you have to give an absence of yourself Mm -hmm. um, if you're you are not being respected. And I do think ultimately a lot of this comes down to lack of respect. Yeah. Um, Lack of acknowledgement of of Mm. who you are and and your lived experience and all of that stuff. Um, But yeah, I think a lot of us get a lot of self-worth from our work. And we pour a lot of ourselves into it. And it gives us a sense of we're doing good and we're making right and we're doing work that's, that we can be proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, your coworkers and, like, the people around you, the people that are working with you, you should hopefully be proud to be working with them. And if they make you feel unwanted or unseen, then you don't have to give all of yourself to them. Uh, you might need to work on boundaries. Yeah. yeah. That's fair. What's your answer? I think similarly to honestly both of you, um, I think facts and feelings a little bit both Um, because, you know, I like being in the middle there. Um, But I think you can factually say, you know, like, hey, it is a fact that the meeting space that you always pick for us does not have chairs that accommodate my body. I need a different chair or we need a different space. Plain and simple, right? That is something that I would absolutely, if I could go back to my real estate life, like if I could turn back time, nope, I'm not going to sing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but if I could turn back time, yeah, I would I would literally, like I think I, it jogged my memory when you said that because like every Tuesday we went into the same room. I had the most god-awful chairs and I would have bruises on my legs for days, for days because I squeezed myself into this chair and I squeezed myself. I wanted to take up less space instead of saying, hey, can we just meet in a different room because yeah. I don't fit in these chairs, right? So yeah, I would absolutely say these are the facts. The chair doesn't fit me. New space or new chair. That's all. Um, but then I would, I would very much, you know, I would say to the people who used to say, you know, oh, I'm so fat. I'm so gross. I'm so disgusting. Like I, I'm in the room, I, you know, I'm in the room or, hey, the way that you talk about your body makes me feel very Um, so I don't know. I might say that, or like you said, I do think that it is very much about managing expectations, um, and knowing when to remove yourself from spaces. And if people have something to say about that, why do you always get up when we start talking about X, Y, and Z? It's shitty. Okay. I'm so sorry, but now I have to share this. Absolutely. Taryn taught me, shout out to Taryn, (laughs) taught me the most amazing thing when people are saying stuff around me that I don't want to hear or listen to and I use it all of the time. Yeah. We're going to recognize that you use it with us a lot. Let's hear it. No, I don't think I don't think I have used it with you. <laughs> okay. But I, but We're you might have heard out. me say it. Um so let's just say like we ate lunch and like someone's sitting there being like, "Oh, we're going to have to walk a lot to like eat off the eat off oh, I'm so glad I don't think about that anymore." Oh, I love that. <gasps> oh no, it gets better. Oh. I really want ice cream, but I shouldn't have it. I, I'm going to, I'll be so bad. I, like, I don't want to be bad and have it. That's so sad for you. <laughs> That's so Gagged. sad for you. My mom <laughs> always told me that if someone said something to you and they seem to not be realizing who they're talking to, like they're saying something that's very obviously pointed at, like they're saying it about themselves, but it's very pointed or, yeah. or whatever. It's like, what do you mean by that? <gasps> oh yeah. Making people explain. Yeah. yeah. So like when people say, oh, I, I'm so fat today. Oh. What do you mean? What do you mean by that? With that tone. <laughs> yeah, I was like, ready to throw hands. No, <laughs> I, I, needed, them like that I, too. Needed, I needed to not engage, right? I needed to be like, go away. So these are the pushing away. Oh, see, I would engage. I know you would, but I, I needed I like to not fester on ice cream's bad for you and I shouldn't eat this. And then that leads me to not. It's eat, creating no. a separation. It just, yeah. You think oh, that? I don't that's think That's so this. sad for you. Yeah. Oh, I'm so glad I don't think about that anymore. But I think for me, like, it's as, so good. As much as I say, like, I like confrontation, it's more like, am I instigating? Yes. But is it because I do want to have a conversation and maybe change not only the way that they speak 
around other people, but maybe the way they speak to themselves. Yeah, that is kind of what I'm hoping for. Right. But also at the same time, it is advocating for yourself. It's, you know, oh, I was just making a joke. It didn't land. It didn't land. You know, oh, d take a joke. Make one. Right. That's Sally's favorite. Like That is one of my favorites that is, because I grew up in a family of take a joke. Oh, you're too sensitive. Take a joke. Fucking make one because you didn't make me laugh. You made me cry. Right. So I, I think I am very much in my era of like, please explain yourself further. Right. If you're going to insult me or if you're going to say something shitty, explain yourself, explain yourself or say something that actually lands with me. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. Nothing like an alley rant to bring us to the end. <laughs> Nothing like an alley rant. <laughs> Well, we're fat. <laughs> we're fab. No, I wanted to say fab. Well, then, girl, you should have said Okay, fine. It. I'll come, I'm coming up with a different F. We're, we're fat, we're fab, and we are ferocious. <laughs> the, the shape she made. I could tell it was an F-R word. I was like, there's an the R coming in here, and I was like, where is it going? <laughs> I thought you were like, where? Fruity. <laughs> I was like, what are you doing? I was trying to find an F word that matched what we talked about today. Guys, I hope there. that this episode landed with you. I did, ferocious. You. Yeah, I'll leave uh, it. it landed with us, I think. I hope it landed with you. I'm just going to keep talking until we're these two figure friends. out. We're also friends. Yes. We are friends. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>